How is everybody? Just a few minutes early. Hope everybody's doing okay. Oh, yay, you didn't forget. I know I meant to put one of those countdown things and I forgot. <laughs> I forgot to do that. Okay. Oh, I forgot they've changed this. So I think I have to wait for them to pop in here. Oh, there's Sarah. Hi, hi. Turn up my volume. There we go. I never have it loud enough. Hello. Hi, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can. Just fine. Awesome. Well, how have you been? Oh, busy. <laughs> yeah. How have you been? Uh, same with summer with kids being home it's no schedule it's a little um i forget things every day like what we're supposed to be doing because i'm not used to summer routine like my yes. daughter's gymnastics class i forget it every week <laughs> let's see Hi. oh yes so who who in here so far has already read or listened to anti-hero Hi, how are you? Hey. <laughs> Hi. You doing okay? Yeah, doing. I just got out of the pool with my kids and stuff at my sister's house for the summer and just like nice. I feel good and relaxed and yeah, happy to be here. Nice. I was out on the lake all day today. Every summer, myself and some of my best girlfriends, all of our kids go to a zoo camp and on one of the days that week, we have something called uh, Ladies Day on the Lake. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so uh, my best friend Cameron, they own a boat. And so her husband plays our captain. He brings his iPad and his earbuds so he can just ignore us. And <laughs> about seven of us just spend all day out on the boat on the lake. And it was fabulous. That sounds like so nice. divine. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, if I had done that today, I would not be on this live right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be well, we, out we eventually had to go and pick the children up from zoo camp. Yep. That makes sense. Let's be okay. careful with our day drink. <laughs> <laughs> Hi from Sydney. That's far away. Nice. Well, uh, Sarah, how was your vacation? It was very nice. It was long. You know, when like a vacation you know, like rounds out like day nine and you're like, okay, <laughs> that's enough. Let's go home. I don't um, know. I don't know if I feel that way. <laughs> uh, it was our first really cruise. Ever get that and way. So, oh, first oh. you know, a cruise is so fun, but it's so like, it's overwhelming. It's a lot of like just stuff and things and you're like, you know, uh, but it was very relaxing and beautiful and we had a lovely time and um, I feel very refreshed and like ready to hit the ground running again, so. Yeah, and get back to writing. Yes, catch <laughs> up on how very behind I am. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay, well, let's see, we're a few minutes into this, so I'm gonna do quick introductions, and we're just gonna start taking questions from people, and I'm just gonna ask you guys about Antihero, and you know what it was like for you recording it, what it was like for you writing it, and then we'll see where the conversation goes. Okay, so if you're new joining us, Sarah Kate is a number one Amazon selling author. You have probably heard of the Salacious Players Club, and that series has five books. Uh, book six will wrap it up, and that's probably what she's going to go and work on when this is done. <laughs> and that's going to be out later this year. And Stephanie Namath Parker, um, she is actually one of the narrators on Antihero. She narrates under another name, Vivian LaRue. She gave me permission to say that. <laughs> um, so we're real excited to talk to her. She has narrated over 200 audiobooks and is also Crazy. an Audi Award nominated this year. So, <laughs> so she knows what she's doing. She's fabulous. She also did oh, Praise. I did a lot of that's true. I don't remember that. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah. She worked on that one. 
Um, Jacob Morgan is the other narrator and he is unable to join us tonight. So, so busy, Sarah, busy. yes, very busy. Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about Antihero for anyone who hasn't heard about it yet or just your process in writing it? What gave you the idea? I absolutely loved it. I mean, oh, devoured, you. devoured the book. It was so good. So well done. Thank you. Um, you know, I wanted, obviously, you know, as you said, Salacious Players Club is coming to an end. So I wanted to do something different, but also in the same world. Um, so Antihero is part of the Good Brothers series, which does take place in the same like universe as Salacious Players Club. There is a small crossover um, that some people have picked up on. Um, but essentially, I love playing with um, taboo, especially religious taboo uh, themes in in my romances. So I've written a couple of priest romances. And so for this one, uh, I decided to take it another direction and do this, you know, preachers, uh, preacher's sons, because it's a brother series. And I've never really done a brother series. And I've always wanted to do one. So so yeah, Antihero is the first book. It's about Adam. He's the oldest brother. Uh, he wants to follow in his dad's footsteps. Um, one day become, you know, the famous preacher that his dad is. But then one night he discovers that his dad is not as uh, pious as he thought. So he decides to take revenge, finish his family's reputation because of it. So that's what sort of spurs the events of the book. In a very creative way. <laughs> Love it. Um, Stephanie, what was it like for you narrating this book? So, I mean, the second I got the offer, I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. And it's with Jacob Morgan. I was just in heaven. So it was like <laughs> dream writer. I mean, Sarah already knows how much I loved praise. It was just such a fabulous book and I got so many comments from people you know like kind of how true to the the kind of the the BDSM like the praise how, how true it was to that kink if you want to say so people really felt like it was so authentic that they could really relate to it that was the feedback that I got they're like my god you know sometimes people will write in this BDSM world and they don't you know, they think they know what they're doing or talking about, and they don't really have a clear grasp of what it really is. So I really already love that with praise. So I was like, you know, I, I told Sarah, I was like, you know, I slipped into our DMs. I'm like, you know, anything you have, <laughs> I will love to, to narrate for you. So please, you know, if you can keep me in mind, I, you know, I will bend over backwards and whatever. So, um, so and when I got Antihero, I was like, First of all, I was like, oh my God, thank you, Sarah. And then I was like, Jacob Morgan, like dream. I love working with him so much. And and then when I read it, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is so good. So what I did that I don't really, I don't really ever have a chance to do is that in a duet narration, I think I told you about this, Tiffany, is that, you know, you don't record them. Most of them are not recorded together. There are some um, publishers that request that, that they be that they're done together. Um, but usually they're not because it's extremely expensive to pay the narrator time, blah, blah, blah. So what I did, because I love the book so much and I knew that, I mean, Jacob is recording. He was like a day ahead of me. So I went and listened to all of his lines before I recorded my lines. So I, it was like literally like I was trying to really act from what he gave me in so those, cool. you know, like... So in good. that scene so I, that's what i did for the whole book so it took me a little bit it took me longer than normally i would take on a book but i just i loved it so much and i just felt like it could be something really special if i really paid attention if i really just could act with him so that's what mm -hmm. i did for this book that's so, so cool. i hope it came through i don't know but yeah. <laughs> I really oh, gave it, everything I it was so authentic so yeah. fantastic have you ever narrated any other books that way where you're listening no. to it no Okay. I have, I have done, I've had a couple of, you know, the problem is, is that I'm usually the first person to record and I'm pretty sure the guys don't, 
don't do listen to other people's stuff. I just, I have that feeling it could be, they maybe they listen all the time, but I don't know. <laughs> but I did do that with, um, I had a chance to do that with, um, the temporary wife with Joe Arden. Um, and I listened to not all of them, but I had like a few of his chapters that when I think kind of like the really emotional moments or pivotal times that I would go back and try to listen to, or like in a fight and like in an argument mm -hmm. to try to listen to what he was giving me exactly how he gave it to me so that I could kind of have a, a you know, correct response because you don't hear it otherwise. And you're just imagining what they would say, you know? So, yeah. I never I thought about it like that. This, That's really interesting. Yeah. Because I guess ideally with narrators, <clears throat> you guys would communicate at least a little bit before you start recording the book just to try to talk through some of those pivotal scenes or how you're going to show a kid. I, yeah. I know it does not usually happen. Nobody ever, nobody ever communicates like that from the other side, if that makes <laughs> any sense. Yeah, <laughs> I feel what you're saying. You um, and somebody asked, it is so a far. duet style narration, which is what she is talking about right now. So a duet style means in the audiobook, if you have two narrators, they are voicing their own character and any characters within that gen same gender. Um, so it's not like a dual style where maybe the female narrator take can you hear that thunder we're having a massive storm wow. <laughs> <laughs> hope the power doesn't go out at the start that's what happens <laughs> um but in dual style so the female narrator will take her point of view chapter and she will voice all of the characters within that one chapter and then if the chapter switches to a different POV, then that other narrator will take on that. So it's a different style of narration and people have really strong feelings about how they feel about that. It's so interesting because I just being a part of this community on book talk here on TikTok and then on Instagram, especially with newer listeners, they really like the duet style narration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely seems to be growing in popularity. I've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, 100%. I've never done so many that, that I have this year, for sure. Yeah. This was my first, this was my first duet. I mean, obviously, I didn't have a whole lot to do with it other than like paying for it. <laughs> but, um, you know, this was the first one that Those I've done. Chance. Yeah. Um, and it was so cool to listen to it. You know, it was the first time I got to listen to one of my books and duet narration. I mean, it's always amazing listening to your, your book narrated. Um, but, you know, to listen to this one, first of all, from you two, you know, were like two of my favorites. And it was just so cool. I would imagine as an author that being kind of an out of body experience because you're hearing voices in your head. Mm -hmm. And I would also think there's probably points in the book where maybe you thought about things being interpreted a little bit differently than how the actors end up interpreting Sometimes, I mean, but more often than not, it sounds so much more natural or I won't catch that because they're reacting, you know, to it essentially. And so it just comes out sounding natural and I never have caught a moment where I'm like, oh, I wouldn't have said that like that or I would, I would have, you know, done that differently. It's always, it just always sounds so natural and like perfect. And to the point where sometimes I'm like, did I write that? Uh, that was me. I did that. Like, you know, <laughs> oh, cool. That sounds really cool. <laughs> have you ever had That's a moment so where you're listening to the audiobook and you have, because you've written so many words, is there ever a moment where you think, I completely forgot about that? You know, I forgot about that scene or I forgot about that moment. Cause yes, so for ago. sure. Um, there's a few that I like to go back and listen to um you know just tidbits here and there when i get the chance and yeah there's always a few moments where i'm like oh i forgot about that or you know just great lines that sound you know are okay when i write them right i'm like okay but then i hear them say them and i'm like oh that's a great line like it's just the way they say it there's one in um give me more it's aaron shedlock does it and just the way he says the line it's something like you should taste her or something. And I'm like, oh man, like that's a great line. That sounds so hot. But I didn't think about it when I wrote it, you know, so it's always fun. So how did you two originally um, or initially get connected with Praise? 
Um, I'm an audition request. Audition. Right? Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure I yeah. put out. You know, I was working with um, a different company than than this one, but I put out like, "Hey, I need this. Is what I need." Um, and he would send me, "Well, here's some you know female narrators that sound about right," and I would go listen to him, and be like, "Oh, this is perfect," or whatever, you know. So. I don't remember if there was an actual audition or he just sent me names, but that's how it there started. There was. No, no. I auditioned. I did. You did good. <laughs> yeah. I, I, thank you so much. I feel so lucky. <laughs> it was perfect. Both of, I think both Charlie and Sage are, you know, sort of quirky characters, you know, quirky female young mm -hmm. characters who are both headstrong or both you know, confident in their weirdness. And there's just something about that that you seem to capture really well. Thank you. I mean, I love, take, I feel take like that's from that really, whatever you want. Feels very me, especially in my twenties, <laughs> you know, very quirky, but kind of, you know, confident and didn't mind to be different. And so maybe that comes through. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I was I wonder what I'm doing. I'm writing down when people are asking <laughs> questions so we can come back to them. Oh, yeah, I've seen yeah. a few roll by and I have not caught any I'm of try, them. I'm trying to keep up with notes. Well, someone just asked what's next in the series for the Good Brothers. Um, so the next book in the Good Brothers series is The Homewrecker. And I have not given out any um, details about that other than it is Caleb, um, the next, you know, brother in line. There's twins, Caleb and Lucas. So the next one is about Caleb and his wife, Briar. So that is the home record. And that's literally all I've given. It comes out in February of 2024. So. Yes. So we have to get to Madam first. We're going to finish. I wanted to sort of inter interweave them a little bit so that, um, you know, we could get started on a new series before we end the first one. But we got um, Madam coming out in October and, um, and then this, yeah, in February. So how long does it typically take you to write one of your books? Um, typically about two to three months. Um, I like it to be more on the two month side, but um, there's been so many events and I have a really bad way of saying yes to all of them. So um, with all this travel, it's just like really killed my productivity. Uh, so it's a little more on the three month side right now, but I generally write them within three months and then they take about a month and a half to be edited and proved and all that. So, and I am quite behind on Madam. <laughs> so. It's okay. You've got some time. You're done with your traveling for a while. Well, no, for a little while. Done. Yeah. For a little while we're done. Um, and now that I'm, you know, this year I have tried to prioritize getting audio done in time for the release. <clears throat> So Antihero was the first one I've ever done pre-order. And I know, you know, Tiffany, you and I chatted about this a little bit, but um, you have to have it done. I mean, even earlier if you're doing the pre-order because they want it, you know, uploaded by a certain date and it becomes kind of a hassle. Um, but that adds just like a whole, you know, yeah, Madam doesn't come out until October, but I mean, I have to have it to my narrators by like next month. So I feel that that time goes by really fast. So, and they, you know, need a couple of months to, to do it and, and, you know, get it back edited, edited. and all that so I can yes. upload it on time. So yeah, it's, it goes by fast. Yeah. I, I don't think people understand that for an author to try to book narrators and get that audiobook prepared, it, depending on who you want, it can take a year. I mean, I'm booking narrators for projects where I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is what, you know, this is, these are the characters like, you know, that aren't even being right. narrated until next year. I just have to get on their schedule. I'm like, uh, I don't think he's British, you know, like things like that, where you don't, you don't really have all that stuff. And obviously narrators and producers want as much information about the characters in the audiobook as they can get, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's really hard, you know, to like, nail all that down ahead of time far in advance i mean i have books all the way through 2020 like december 2024 already booked out for romance stuff 
Yeah. I mean, the thing was, is I really didn't have a space for the anti. I was really booked up, but I took a weekend because I had, I couldn't, I mean, I just couldn't say no. So it was like, but I was completely my whole, I mean, I'm booked through February, 2024 right now. So, but I have spaces, you know, like if right. really great projects come in. So you have to always try to make a space, which is so hard because you don't really want to have too many spaces, right? You, but you want to be able to like, if something, you know, like the anti-hero or, you know, one of my favorite um, authors that I work for has something that comes up or drops in, then it's like, yes, just give it to me, you know, and it's a weekend. Yeah, and, and you, like, you're, I think you're going to be seeing a lot of that. Like you have, you know, grown so much and are out there getting awards and commercials and all that amazing stuff. Like yeah. you better leave a lot of room in that schedule because you're going to be getting so many offers. I hope. It's a good as problem. Keep me in your rotation. I'll be happy. I'll be happy as long <laughs> as you keep me in yours. <laughs> so this is an interesting question. Um, the SAG after strike, how <laughs> or does that affect audiobook narrators who are also members of SAG? Zero. Unless we do, I, like I can't do any TV. I can't do any like TV commercials now. As, it, as you know, on that, that VO side, but as far as audiobooks, it's there's n zero. That contract was negotiated last year, so I think we have a couple of years and for, for what we have right now in place for us, as far as that goes. So it just, it just affects people like who are working on the other side of VO too, a little bit. Not too much, actually, but a little bit. Yeah, like animation projects. I was going to say, like animated projects. Mm hmm. You said some, but not all. Does it just depend on what the studio is or? It depends if it's a studio or, you know, um, independent things or certain kinds of, you know, things have been already negotiated that fall under different kinds of contracts. It's kind of, it's, it's a little bit in, in the air. People are really, you know, trying to double check and make, making sure their agents know what they're, you know, what, what they can and can do. Well. I am glad that it does not affect because that would be so sad if all of a sudden there was just this halt on audiobook production. <laughs> I mean, when it comes yeah. to movie and TV, from an entertainment standpoint, I'm like, ah, that's fine. Like, I don't watch TV. I don't, I'm not talking about for the actors. Obviously, it's a really big deal for them. But if all of a sudden audiobook production just halted, I would be so sad. <laughs> I would be. It's so true. Sad. I mean, that's Catch up on working, our libraries. But... It's true. I have so many. <laughs> Okay, let's see. There's a I couple read of for other... pleasure for once. That would be crazy. <laughs> crazy, <laughs> wild. Let's see. Uh, someone asked earlier, Sarah, do you have a favorite book that you've written? Ooh, um, I get that question a lot, and it's always different mm -hmm. um, depending on, I guess, maybe my mood or go away um, or something of that nature. But say my favorite um I really love free fall because of just the experience I had when writing it it was the kind of book that wasn't ever supposed to be really be written and so um it was it just it was the first time I've ever experienced characters completely taking over and um writing the book <laughs> or plotting the story I guess I should say it just really wow. happens sometimes um Otherwise, I'm, you know, um, Mercy is one of those books that just really um, resonated with me. Like it was a character that I related to. I know it sounds really weird because you're like, you wrote it. But, you know, sometimes that just happens where you don't realize how much you relate to a character until you're writing it, you know, and, and you realize this is me. This is my experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that was definitely that one's close to my heart as well. And let's see, is there a genre that you would want to try to write in that you haven't yet? A uh, genre. Um, I'm guessing they were meaning maybe outside of romance. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> outside of romance, no. I will always write romance. Um, something maybe outside of contemporary romance. Um, I would say, uh, I think maybe, you know, it might be fun to do something paranormal. That's where I started reading. I was a paranormal romance junkie. So 
maybe I could do that, but as for right now, I'm I'm pretty Ooh, vampires. So you <laughs> yeah. looked you were a Twihard? Oh yeah. Well I Twilight, even before that, um I was if, if anybody's this old, um J.R. Ward's Black Brotherhood. Like oh, back in the day yeah. before we had Kindles, like and you'd have to like drive around to find the next book in the series. Like it was a struggle back in the day, kids. Like <laughs> you know and so <laughs> they're on my shelf somewhere but yeah that that back in those days yep. uh passion flicks bought the rights to this i they're know a, either a movie or a series i'm not exactly a series story. i feel like it's got to be a series because it's just there's too many books so many books yeah and they really like to stay to the page as much as possible so i really love that yeah that's fun what uh stephanie what about you some romance books like what were some of the early ones that you read and made you fall in love with the genre do you know what i was not a romance reader at all the first books that i read were stephen king when i was 11 years old i read christine that was like my big first book so i love horror actually um wow. but what got me into romance was historical romance because i always felt like i was in the wrong like i was born on the wrong continent in the wrong you know, in the 1800s would have been perfect. <laughs> Jane Austen, I love Charles Dickens. So I love listening to historical romance. So that's why, I mean, I have a series now that's I'm doing that I absolutely love by an independent author, but it's with, it's like Jane Austen with dragons, right? So Ooh. it's just- Wait, what is that? What is so, that I mean, it's, it's The first one's called A Proper Dragon and I just did an, a subtle dragon and an elusive dragon. Um, but they're really, they're really well written, I have to say. They're really good. So I started out kind of in the historical romance area. And then, if, you know, I've gotten, now I've gotten to where I absolutely, you know, love any kind of romance. Because like I've said before, I, I, I narrate such a variety of books that when I came out of, I always say this story, um, Where Coyotes Howl, um, a book that I finished, I, I think I recorded it in January. I literally had to take a day off. I did not work. And, I was so destroyed because that book is so, is so bittersweet that I was the next book after that. Thank God I had a, had a day that I could take off. The next book was a was a romance, and I was like, oh thank God, oh my God, a happy ending. I'm so yeah, <laughs> I'm so yeah. happy to you know even you have your emotional things that happen or whatever. It's there's there's going to be a, you know there's like light mm -hmm. at the end of the tunnel. You know it's not like everybody's dying and and I, I mean it's just it was it's, that's what I feel like romance gives to me. It's kind of, it's, it's hopeful, it's hopeful and it's sweet and it can be beautiful and, and, and especially like with Antihero, I loved how, how you take the shame away, you know, from, 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 from owning who you are as a person and how, you know, what sex is like for you. There is no right or wrong as long as everything is, con you know, consensual and you're, you know, and, and everyone's getting something from it in a joyful way, then what does it matter what you're doing? You know, and I love those kinds of things that, that make everyone feel accepted. I, I love that about, about, especially about the anti-hero in particular. Um, well, speaking of historical romance, we can talk about it now or I can message you, but my audiobook club that uh, meets on the Face app, I don't know if we're allowed to say that on here, <laughs> um, <laughs> in about two months, we want to have a vote for everybody in the group to decide on a historical romance. So we'll need to find three different ones and let people vote because we try to mix it up every month and do different tropes, different narrators, different subgenres, you know, all kinds, dual style, multicast, graphic audio. Um, so we have not done a historical romance yet, and it's not something that I have oh. listened to. I have read some historical romance that I'll need to get. That's why I wrote that down, The Proper Dragon. Proper Dragon. Add that in there. Um, Laura wanted to know, Sarah, what is the hardest book or trope that for you to write so far? Oh, good question. Um. The hardest book for me to write, I mean, honestly, Antihero was really tough. <laughs> it was really tough. Um, not so much because of the subject matter. That was really easy for me. <laughs> um, like airing out my religious trauma, easy. Um, but it was hard because 
you know, it was coming on the heels of like a pretty popular series. Um, I really wasn't sure if people were going to tolerate more for me in like a weird way. That's the best way I can put it. Um, or if like all they wanted for me was salacious players clubs, it was just a really, um, like a lot of pressure. Um, plus I was taking it in a kind of a weird direction because I decided to sort of take on this, um, like, deconstruction sort of angle and which isn't inherently sexy <laughs> so um i wasn't quite sure if there's just a lot of pressure to write that book and not to mention i i hated adam at the beginning but i was supposed to I mean, you're supposed to hate him he's he's kind of a pompous asshole <laughs> Sorry, in the beginning, you know, and he was supposed to be so learning to love him and redeem him and mm -hmm. um, but also relate to him was was really difficult um, because he was elusive to me. Just I couldn't I couldn't quite get a grasp of who he was um, until towards, you know, the end. So we went through a lot together. I'll just say that it was a tough it was a tough book to write. Oh, the depth of those characters, though. So good. Because I didn't really, I mean, other than just the blurb that he would throw out there on Insta, I didn't, I did not realize going into it that it was going to be such a deep, emotional, like this huge character arc story, this journey that Adam is really going on, um, dealing with so much of the... I don't think I did either, honestly. So going oh, but I mean, I I ate it up. I love stories like that. Yeah, redemptions are definitely my favorite. Like, absolutely. Uh, yeah, redemptions are my favorite. Um, but it's hard. It's one thing to redeem a character that's like bad in a sexy way, you know, like he's a bully or he's you know like a bad boy, right? But you gotta like redeem this character who's you know, who, who, who's self-righteous, who thinks that he's right and who can be, you know, degrading in not a nice way or not a sexy way um, that I struggled with. That was hard. Um, and I was really scared that that was not going to translate well, you know, but um, yes, thank you. Bo's redemption is different than Adam's redemption. I guess that's the perfect way to put it was Bo's redemption really was different. So um yeah it was it was just yeah it was, it was a challenge which i like a challenge though but i remember you telling me that because i would i would message her behind like <laughs> when i was recording and be like oh my god you like rip my heart out or oh my god i love this line and sarah you were like really because i wasn't sure uh, you you told me the exact same thing and i'm like what I, I mean i don't know i mean i'm loving it so i you know I, I can't imagine anyone else not as well, but that's something that I don't know if I'm supposed to do, but I do. Like if I've I had any contact with the author before, because <laughs> I just think, I just think maybe you would like to know, like, you know, my heart is on the floor. I'm bawling, crying because this, this so I think I reached out like two or three times in that book and was like, oh well, my God. You know, especially you had it way before anybody. I mean, I have like maybe five or six people who read it almost immediately before it goes to editors and things like that. But narrators will get it before arc readers do. And so, you know, to sort of wait that reader feedback, it was really encouraging. I have some of the worst imposter syndrome. So nearly every book I'm like, you really like it? Cause I think it's terrible. You know, like it's just, oh. it's, it's the worst. Um, so no, that was really encouraging and nice. And I always like having a relationship with my narrators cause it's, you know, it's so in a weird way, kind of like an intimate related, like you're reading the stuff that came from my brain, you know, and you're, you're performing it. And so, you know, it's nice to have a relationship with narrators. I love it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> And both of their characters, Adam and Sage, they felt so real to me. Like they didn't feel like just characters that someone created in a book. It's like, I could know these people. I could know someone struggling and dealing with these things separately or together in real life because they felt so real to me. That's nice, thank you, I'm glad.
But I did not like Adam's father. Well, you weren't supposed to. I know. It was terrible. <laughs> terrible. He is absolutely oh. unredeemable. Like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Like, absolutely forever. awful. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, as somebody who I grew up with in the church, I am a Christian. I worked for a church for 14 years um, before I started doing stuff like this. Had a very positive experience. I know that is not everybody's experience. Uh, even that, that being my background, listening to this book, I had such deep sympathy for the characters because I know, I know that that kind of stuff happens and the deep shame that people can feel growing up for many different reasons. You just kind of focused on one thing or one particular thing, but for a lot of people, it could look very different. Um, but it just moved me to tears, the part where he takes her back to the the church that he grew up at. And it was mm -hmm. like old and dilapidated, you know, and his dad's in this mega church, like this huge million dollar show basically that's mm -hmm. put on. And, and uh, Adam says at one point, like, this is where I first met God. And it was just small and simple. And oh my gosh, I was Don't just weeping. Don't make me tear up. Don't make me tear up. I had goosebumps all over me. I'm like, yes, that's, yes. <laughs> God, this feels so good. It's so real. It was a beautiful moment. Absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm, I'm sure I had a tear in there too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm tearing up now. <laughs> it's funny because I think for me sometimes when I read really good writing and like you're saying, Tiffany, like you can you really connect with the characters are written so well that they're so three dimensional that for me, it makes it just so easy to to to, to just kind of like key in and connect with those characters because they're so you just wrote them so real that, you know, even just talking about it again, I can absolutely picture that moment when it was happening and the emotion behind it and just this makes me it just makes makes it so easy to kind of get emotional because I, I i felt so connected to those characters and in that moment too so it's a gift girl it's a gift. It's so sweet that's very nice to hear and i'm glad i can make your job a little easier <laughs> you do so enjoyable <clears throat> makes it so enjoyable you know it's like really hard because i'm really like it's like when you, you know how when you, you, you have something like you feel is really special, then you want to go like that extra, it's like you just go that extra mile to really make it, you know, do every single thing you can to just give it everything you've got because it's just so, it demands it almost, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. well, you did perfect. You did great. Thank you. The whole thing was wonderful. I tried. So I did it, my best. It's obvious. <laughs> And so many people are talking about it. I mean, from what I can see, early reviews and how people feel about the book and the audiobook, people are loving it. And that's it's amazing to hear, and it's very encouraging. And um, you know, I'm like I'm one of those. I'm, you know, I don't go looking. I I try not to go looking for <laughs> reviews or anything like that. I don't read reviews. I try to stay away. I have people who are my buffers, you know, try to keep me from seeing things that, you know, cause like I said, I have, you know, terrible imposter syndrome. I think it's probably a writer's best friend or, or maybe the other way around, right? We, we can't get rid of it. It's just there. Um, when you're creating something that's so personal and so, you know, it's just coming from my brain. So obviously it's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna judge it and chew it apart and think it's the worst, right? You know? So when things, you know, reviews and stuff come out, which obviously are not meant for me. And I know that, so I never try to like go looking for them, but I do feel the, the reception, right? Like I do, I do feel everybody is enjoying this or people are, are relating to it or are connecting with it in a way that's, you know, more important than, than just some review, right? Like it, right. it connected to a character and I, I, I've talked about this before, but um, I was on a panel recently with uh, um, Sophie Lurk was on the panel with me. So I'm gonna give her credit for this line because it was great. But she said, when we write books, it's like a siren song, you know, trying to find people who feel and think the way we do, um, which is, it just hit me so hard. Cause I'm like, that is exactly how it is. Like, 
when you relate to a person that you've written this book and, and they feel that it's it's something so amazing and a gift. I mean, it's just to be able to do this. It's, it's really amazing. So I'm going to get choked up, but I'll shut up. Now. Oh. <laughs> no, I missed that panel, but I did hear people talking about that. It was, it was amazing. I was up there with like Sierra Simone and Sophie Lark and oh, um, oh Jennifer oh, Hartman. I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> so many Stop good it. panels at Book Bonanza having to choose which ones to go to. Oh, I, bet. I basically just camped out where all the narrators were. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the ones that I went to. Yeah, I bet. But I would have wanted to go to so many more. Yeah, it was, it was, it was great. So speaking of book events, how many more do you have this year? I think I know at least two more that you're going to. Um, so I have Wanderlust, which is in San Antonio next month, August 19th. Um, before that, I have just a small one in LA at the, I forget the name of the store, I always do this. Um, uh, oh, I'll never forget it, I'll never remember it. Anyway, um, and then I've got Love in Vegas, which is such a big hey. fun event at the end of October, so. Um, I, it's driving distance. I'm in Arizona, so it's super easy for me. And uh, I love that event. I love Vegas. It's so fun. I've never been. I'm very excited. Are you going this year? Yes. Yay. Yes, I will be there. So yeah, I'm wondering if it's going to feel super overwhelming it's, and overstimulating. It is, because not only are you at this huge book event, which is, I mean, not, not quite book bonanza size, but it's, there's a lot, there's a lot of people there. And then you add on top of that, like you're in Vegas or like ding, 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 like just, you know, lights and, and sounds and everything. It's very overwhelming. Uh, somebody asked about Arizona. I do have, um, I do a lot of signings in Arizona. Obviously I live here. So any chance I get, um, there's one on November 11th called books in the desert, I believe. And then I always stop at my local Barnes and Noble after I have a book release. So you check out my website. I usually have them up there. Yeah. So there's like a ton of Barnes and Nobles here. So I try to hit them all up. I would love that. It's like a local, well, there is now a local author. She should have done that. She should have gone to uh, Barnes and Noble. That would have been really fun. Yeah. They'd love having, you know, indie authors there. I mean, just come in on a Saturday for a couple hours, sign some books. It's fun. I should ask her about that. What about you? What about uh, book events for next year? I know, I think you're done for this year, but big travel plans, yeah. Um, I only have a, I have Dragon Con in Atlanta, which is not really book signing, but there's a book, big kind of release. I'm part of a big sci-fi lit RPG kind of four authors are all writing in the same world. So two books each is coming out with Podium. So I'll be there with them, with the authors and with Podium, um, promoting that whole series. And then, but that's it for this year. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's so hard living in Switzerland. It, I really hate the fact that it's just, <laughs> it really keeps me from travel. I mean, I love it. Don't get me wrong. It's a great place to live and everything, but it keeps me from kind of attending signings and things that would be so much fun, you know, because I can just like hop over and take a weekend and it's like a whole commitment. And next year is when my son graduates from high school, so I won't be able to do that. But I'm looking at maybe um, Readers Take Denver. Readers Take Denver. A possibility. Yeah. Maybe. We'll see. But that's like would be kind of one of my options for next year. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine that's difficult, you know, traveling that that's far. So hard. Yeah. But I'm sure living in Switzerland is also lovely, so. <laughs> it yes. is. It's a great place to raise kids, you know. It's really mm -hmm. for me it's hard because I was born in Florida and I grew up in I mean I was in LA and so I love the sun and Switzerland is not really conducive to that from November to February, March. Oh. <laughs> so yeah. it's a little bit the winter is hard for me. So I kind of, you know, I really buckle down and just and stay in my booth downstairs and record, record, record. So I try to get through, but it's a great place to raise kids. So it's the payoff that I'm happy to, to pay. I have visited Zurich. It was many oh. years ago. We were there for a very short period of time. My husband was in graduate school and part of his, I guess, capstone before he graduated 
was a trip to Europe and we went to Milan and Zurich and they met with some business leaders because he was getting his MBA. And I got to tag along. So I just went and explored while he did, you know, school stuff. Nice. <laughs> if it was Geneva. It's a very pretty city. It was beautiful. Oh, yeah, Geneva's nice. Yeah. Oh, Jungfrau, yeah. Yeah. My husband, li we Sehr lived schön. in Germany for a couple of years, so. Oh, wow. Oh, but then do you read Deutsch, oder? No, not that long. <laughs> <laughs> Gar keins. Okay. I wish my son learned it because he went to a German school for a couple of years, but alas, we've been gone too long and he doesn't remember any of it. So I'm like, maybe one day if we go back, it'll like trigger something in your brain and you'll just start speaking German. It could do. Right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Stephanie, how many languages do you speak? I only speak German and uh, English. I mean, I can read uh, Spanish and I can understand it probably 70% because my grandmother's Cuban. Um, and we used to, when I was very young, she used to speak to me only in Spanish, but I kind of lost it. And then, you know, I took it in high school, but then when I came to Switzerland, like the German just pushed out the Spanish out the back door, one ear, then the Spanish went out the other side. So yeah, it's more like if I can, like, I can read it, and, and speak like I can speak it like if I'm doing an audiobook like I've done I just did something mm -hmm. with a Puerto Rican accent and I had to speak like Boricua and things like that with you know so I can do that but to have a conversation it's very trying <laughs> very yes trying that's the, the hardest person. part I studied French from the sixth grade to twelfth grade minored in it in college I mean I had many 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 years of French but conversationally that was what I always struggled with the most and now you know it's been 20 years since I was in college. So I can read it, I can understand it some, but trying to get my brain to conjugate and <laughs> speak. But you know, well, if you went back, you, you pick it up quick. That's, that's the thing. True, like you, true. Like if I'm in Spain, even if I'm in Spain for like three or four days, I start to kind of really, it really starts to kick back in. So take a spend some time, take a year, do France. Yeah, I'll just leave my family. <laughs> like, hey, yeah. just take care of France. Is that it? this life <laughs> solid solid yeah no i'm living my best life now so it's fantastic i'll just i'll just stick to books and audiobooks right now uh i thought this was an interesting question you guys can answer um did y'all study for all of this right or did writing and narrating just speak to you so sarah did you going to be writer did that just kind of happen and then same for you did you always want to be an actor how did you get into um narration <clears throat> um i did always want to be a writer i always wanted to be a storyteller i always say it that way because um there was a time when i thought i would be in filmmaking and i almost went to film school um but then decided to get married and and put a family first and that made film school very hard uh so writing kind of stepped in and um I do have my uh, degrees in creative writing. I mean, I think it's, I think it, it helped to shape me. I don't think it was really necessary, but um, that's paid off. So that's good, but <laughs> otherwise, um, no, I mean, writing is just one of those things that it's like a muscle. You just have to keep doing it. And um, I do spend a little bit of time now and then, you know, on the craft and learning new things and because it's one you know i always feel like the more that i write i feel like sometimes i write the same things or the same way over and over and i get really stuck in it and so i have to kind of like okay let's step back and try something different um shake it up a little bit so but yeah um yeah i've been i did my first play when i was six years old and i wrote it myself and acted in it and i've always you know I didn't always want to be just an actor. I had like, I was one of those kids who was kind of, I was not that I was like good at everything, but I liked everything. I was interested in like all kinds of different things and kind of just ended up with a theater degree and then ended up in LA and kind of ended up in Switzerland as a stay at home mom and never thought I would ever <laughs> live that life. And so when I found audiobooks, I just, it was something for me again, right? Because I think moms tend to get lost in it's your only other job. 
least for me, because I mm -hmm. never wanted to do it. So I got real, I get real fixated on things. Like if I'm going to be a mom, I'm going to be the best fucking mom ever, right? Like I am going to just do everything. I, so perfectionist thing kicks in. So there were, you, then you doubt everything you've ever done. And so when I found audiobooks, I did the same thing. I just kind of jumped in and I was like, I, it was one of those things where I found out about it and I found it out ACX or whatever. And I just did the first, I did like, I'm like, I'm just going to do an audition just to see what it's like, you know? So I got like a little USB mic and I was under my quilt and just to kind of, I'm just going to do one. Right. And then I got the book, like the, <laughs> the very first audition I did, I got the book and I was like, oh my God what do I do now? I didn't know. I had no editing yeah. program. I didn't know how to do anything. So then it was wow. like four months of learning how to do stuff and figuring it out. And then I recorded the book and that was, it'll be four years in October was my first release. So, and I've loved it. So then I've become like, you know, like fixated on being like the best narrator and, you know, I have my little manifestation board with all my little things up there that I want to achieve. And <laughs> I get, I get obsessive. I think that's basically what it is, but it's, it served me because I feel like I've really come very far in a very short time. Yes. Um, as far yeah. as, especially living so far away. So. Right. Yeah, like we have the same timeline. We actually started like my first book came out in November of 20, of 19. So I'm on like four years too, which is so cool. Oh, wow. That's cool. Totally. That's, See, we we had an idea. Like, a, we went long way, in, like... a long way in four years. That's, should be really proud of that mm -hmm. all the accomplishments that you've had yeah because I, I feel very it's, it's, it gives people a lot of mm -hmm. hope too you know people like me when i started doing all this back in the fall and the different things i've been able to experience since then i mean i'm a 42 year old woman <laughs> who like never foresaw any of this kind of stuff happening but when i see other women you know, like you said, I was a stay at home mom. That's what I did. I wanted something that was just mine, just for myself. And so when I see mm -hmm. other women living their dream that way, it inspires me to put myself out there and yeah. hopefully we can keep doing that. I've had, I've had people like send me DM saying, oh my God, like I don't, that I don't even really know. You are so inspiring to me, you know, congratulations on all your success. It just seems like it's just, you know, you're working really hard and it's, but you've inspired me to start my own business. It was in something else completely, but just me, they, I knew them. They used to live in Basel where I live like 10 years ago, but like they moved away back, back to America. And I haven't probably talked to her since she left. And then she just slipped into my DMS and was like, you have inspired me. And I started my own business. It's so um, awesome. I you love know, that. Just watching you. So, but it was so cool. I was like, Oh my God, Congratulations and good for you and you know, go for it. So do you think I did that? <laughs> I inspired you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It. Cause I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. Yeah. Stay yeah. at home mom here. And this is such an inspiration. Yes. Cause you can, you can get kind of lost in that a little bit. You kind of feel like you've lost a part of yourself. Like, I never wanted to be a stay at home mom. That was not my dream and ambition. And I know it is for some people. Um, and I my worked. sister is dream. Yep. Yeah. And but I no, worked not mine, and then not COVID yours. happened and then, you know, kids were home and we had to do the at home learning thing. And, um, yeah, I kind of, for a couple of years, I just was home with the kids and that was really hard. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. It's <laughs> not easy. It's not easy. Don't let anybody to tell you that it's easy. It's not easy. No, it's not. Oh, hi. <laughs> I know, yeah. that's going to be a little comment. I know, I'm scrolling back to make sure I didn't miss anything. Does anybody have any other comments or um, questions before we're going to get off here in just a minute? I didn't want to keep them too late tonight. <laughs> Your books are the best. Oh, thank you. They are. Sarah has great books. It's true. Man, speaking of now kids, I'm gonna have to though, like get mercy. I'm gonna have to get mercy now after you were talking uh, about how much like you connected with that. So I haven't listened to that one yet. So that's gonna be my that's gonna be my list. Um, who narrates that one? 
Yeah. I, I liked Mercy too. There was at the very beginning of that book, and I cannot remember the details, mm. but I remember this paragraph I highlighted in my Kindle. And I felt like that is the most relatable statement for women, single women in their 30s, if I have ever seen one. And I wasn't a single woman, but just reading it and having single friends, like just this idea of like pouring everything into your job and you kind of lose sight of yourself and what you want. Ah, it was near the beginning. I'm obviously getting all the words wrong. I had to confirm because I was like, names are getting away from me when you have like so many narrators, but I know it's Gideon Frost and Lucy Rivers was the first time I worked with Lucy, but. Oh, it's so it's. See, it's I read so that series. I didn't listen to any of those audiobooks because I read them before I got into audiobooks. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's crazy uh, that's... because I'm literally prepping a book right now where the main character is named Gideon Frost. <gasps> the no. character or the narrator? No, the character in the book, like the main character in the book, his name is <laughs> That's funny. and Frost. That's funny. It's, you know, That's it's funny. one of those things when you're an author, you know, your brain holds on to random things, you know, and so you'll be putting together a name and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to pull a name out of somewhere. And so it might be possible that they saw that name and it just, it, it, it wormed its way into their head. <laughs> totally. 100%. That's funny. funny. Very cool. It is. <laughs> Let's see. Give me more has a hold on me. I loved that book. Oh, that's one of that's one that I do like to go back and listen to. Yeah, I think that's been oh, my yeah. favorite so far for the Salacious Players Club. Yeah, it was so different. Was... It was the first time I had read a book like that. And so yeah. because when it started, I just thought, how is this going to work out? I just oh, you mean I don't like, know. Um... How is this going to end? And then by the end of the book, I said, Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> makes sense. They totally made this work. <laughs> that is that's the writer's like bread and butter. There's like, let me make this as impossible. Like I hope they come into this book going like there's no way these yeah. two are gonna end up happy together. Like it's impossible. And then yep. you know, you get them there. That's the bet. That's 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 what well, we're that was a hundred percent my experience. I just thought, I don't know about this. I don't how are they gonna be? <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> It worked. It worked. Accomplished. <laughs> Did it worked? Um, have either of you kind of about this, but kind of not on Netflix? There is a a reality show, and it's called How to Build a Sex Room. <laughs> you watch uh, I have heard about it. Um, it is so interesting. I haven't. I surprisingly, I haven't watched it. Mostly only because I have children and I never get the TV or any form of media to myself. So I have to be careful about what I put on. But um, I I have heard about it and I bet it's very interesting. It is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, this is, um, I mean, I really don't much either, but I think they're in Denver. I think that's where it's based, but it's just normal people who want to shake things up a bit. That's so this dumb. goes in, <laughs> but I mean, they took them to Shibari classes. Oh, that's awesome. And I was watching this around the time that I was reading, give me more and oh. <laughs> very excited. <laughs> well, you know, the, in give me more, there's the, the, you know, the, the kink be kink Airbnb or whatever it is, which is a real thing. I mean, that exists. Um, which I found that out while <laughs> researching that book. And I'm, I was thinking, well, that's that's really interesting. Maybe someday that could be a spinoff, you know, people on this kinky Airbnb. <laughs> there, There is one like that pretty close to where I live. Um, it has all kinds of equipment. Yeah. That you can rent. Might be, and might I would love to know. Sleep. I think it'd be great. My husband's like, how many people have been through here? And I said, how many people stay at a hotel room? I, yeah, I, they would need right? it. It feels kind of the same to me. Yeah. These are the things in books that we just try not to like think about too much, you know? We just yeah. don't focus on. And when I say equipment, I don't mean like small equipment. I mean like furniture. Yeah. Exactly. Well, those sanitized. kinds of things. Things that can be sanitized. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's not too far away. I've, oh, funny. Pictures online are interesting. Yes, I do a 
some fun research in my in my job. So I see some stuff. Really I bet. <laughs> Oh, fun. Um, the place where I take some pole dancing classes, there have been some people who are interested in shibari. And so the owner is people who are experts in that and know what they're doing to come and mm -hmm. teach a class. I got so excited because I thought and shibari is so cool. I mean, I think oh, it's just so pretty, just the patterns with the ropes and how you can yeah. tie things in different and ways. And it doesn't need to be inherently, I mean, sexual. It's, it's no, it's it doesn't. Art, you know, and it's, it's just something, I think it's, it's gorgeous. It's stunning and it's such a cool skill. And yeah, I would totally take one. I don't know if I'd be the, the rigger or the bunny, but it would be a cool, I don't know if I want to experience being lifted off the floor. That seems rather painful, but just I'm the... not. I don't know if I love being restrained a whole lot, but I think it'd be cool to learn. Just the knots are so pretty, and I follow a few on Instagram, and it's just it's, it's just so stunning. Yeah, I thought I would have to go all the way to Atlanta to do something like that, but maybe we're going to end up having. I one guess you're going to get it right there in your hometown. I know my hometown. <laughs> I'll uh, keep you updated on that <laughs> if that ends up happening. Oh, you know, an expert. Well, that's fun. <laughs> uh, Mayhem, I bet you mean Madam. Will the Madam audiobook oh, okay. release at the same time as the book itself? Um, that's the one I'm going to oh. try my best with all of the salacious audios. I mean, it was it was just essentially me trying my best um, to get it to my narrators in time. So with the schedule we have right now, hopefully if I pull it together in time, it should be pretty close. Yeah, it should be pretty close. I don't think there will be a pre-order for this one the same way I did for Antihero. I'm still sort of deciding on how that went or if that's something I wanna keep doing, but um, yeah, it should be pretty close. So is all of Salacious dual and will all of the Good Brothers be in duet? Correct. So yeah, all of Salacious was dual. Um, and yeah, I'm going to try to get the Good Brothers and do it. So awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, it is nine o'clock, and I promised you guys an hour. So <laughs> thank you so much for coming to chat. I really enjoyed just talking with you guys, getting to know you a little bit, and talking about anti hero. Um, so if you have not listened or read Antihero yet, it just went on sale last Friday or got released last Friday. So it's very new. Go check it out. It's an amazing, amazing story. It's really good. Okay. But you ladies Thank have such so a nice night. Us. Thank you so Come much. Nice to chat with you guys. Have a good night. Good nice to chat. All right. Bye. 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 <laughs>